Islamic arts and crafts. The terms arts and crafts used sometimes together are applied to a field that covers examples of artworks usually produced with mediums historically viewed in the Western art as minor arts. Think about pottery, glass, and metal art, calligraphy as opposed to painting and sculpture in Western art. It is important to remember that same mediums and artworks that are classified under Islamic are not seen through the same perspective as Western art. In other words, the issue of major and minor arts as understood in the history of Western art is seen differently in the arts of the Islamic regions. The objective of chapter 4 in your text is to recognize the significance of the art of the object and at the same time to become aware of the importance of the art of decorating surfaces. The surfaces of objects as well as different parts of architectural spaces have provided the perfect blank canvas for the artist to display an array of decorative motifs and styles from which we can gather how each region's taste and aesthetic concerns developed in such arts. You will read about the various materials and techniques as well as various forms of art produced in your text, but remember to look for the essence at the foundation of any design or object in the pre-Islamic art available in the region. As with architecture, these motifs started out from Greco-Roman, Central Asian, or Persian origins, but were eventually appropriated and developed into distinct and innovative forms we find, for instance, after the early 9th century in Samara. The Dome of the Rock is a great example in showing how the decorative motifs closely resemble the Greco-Roman mosaic decorations by utilizing the scroll motif. In this slide, note how the grapevine motif decorates the metal sheet covering the tie beams in between the arches encircling the uh, rock outcropping in the Dome of the Rock. The earlier examples of decoration and enhancements include the use of carved stone. As you recall from the last chapter, the facade of the Yamashata Palace was decorated in carved lace-like patterns. Marble and other stones were also carved for window screens and door jams. In this slide, there are two different types of such screens, from Damascus and Cordoba on the left, and a carved marble door jam on the right. The interlocking circles in the arch form from the Damascus example stand out against the negative spaces that are the openings. Such screens would have allowed the light in and possibly deterred insects while adding detail and interest to the architecture. The arrangement of designs is also noteworthy since there is an attempt to incorporate harmony, balance, and symmetry. In the example from Medina to Zahra near Cordoba, the grapevine motif is still used but with such symmetry and balance that creates a strong and visually unified design. Other materials used in creating building embellishments and architectural enhancements include stucco for its cost efficiency and wood for its warmth and beauty. Of course, wood was not in abundance in some parts of the Middle East, such as Egypt or Arabia, but this was remedied by importing the necessary supply from other regions such as India or Sudan. Note the design on the stucco grill window from the Umayyad palace is the familiar and symmetrical tree of life motif, while the image on the right distinctly looks different. When the city of Samara was founded by the Abbasids, it appears innovations took place at the same moment in time in the art of surface decoration. The design seems to have been developed out of the scrolls heavily used earlier but articulated and enhanced in such a way that it morphed into a new design. 
the Samara style as it's known has been characterized as including three different styles, one of which, style 3 or C, is identified in this wooden door panel from the time of the Abbasids. In this style, the scroll is simplified, but the lines have been carved at an angle and beveled, which creates not just a raised motif, but a more defined and articulated form within the pattern. The Samara style became influential in other Islamic regions, for instance, the Eastern Islamic lands, as the stucco carvings under the arch and the spandrels in this mosque from Nain, located in northeast of Iran, testifies. The art of surface decoration for buildings was not exclusively for the exterior. If you recall the example of the Samanid ruler's tomb, you surely remember the use of unglazed bricks that form the geometric patterns on the outside. The space inside in this tomb structure also shows the same material and technique are used to decorate the surface of the interior as well. While many of the motifs and patterns used to decorate surfaces in the interior spaces appear geometric without figurative elements, there are extant examples that unify the figurative with the geometric or abstract elements, which create intriguing combinations and design choices. In these wood carving panels, possibly from the 11th century Egypt, the incorporation of animal and human figures into the carvings are clearly present. The technical treatment of the carved shapes, when compared with the Samara style, reveals complex overlapping layers of the carved elements that vary in depth and shape and are much more dynamic and energetic. An overview of the decorative surfaces in the examples reviewed can be summarized in a few but crucial highlights. The art of decorating the surface in Islamic regions that uses various materials and techniques can be viewed as further enhancement of architecture or object, but it has been interpreted and understood as a decorative element that covers like textile. The fact that many of the motifs and patterns are either inspired by or repeated in textile, I believe can make for a convincing argument that the artists often oscillated between the two mediums. One can argue for the flexibility the artists in Islamic regions enjoyed in this respect, which, unlike the Western artists that historically did not go from one medium to another, reproducing the same design, they, meaning the artists in Islamic regions, did not have such restrictions. Thus, their art did not follow the same hierarchy imposed by major and minor arts as seen in the history of Western art. This is true of all other craft medium and artistic productions in the Islamic regions. As you heard me mentioning earlier, the art of decorating surfaces was not just for architecture. There are numerous examples of objects, whether in metal, ceramic, precious material, and fiber arts, in which the art of decorating the surface is consistently practiced, even until today. Among such examples are various metal vessels that are considered the product of an advanced metal technology of its time. The Darenberg Basin from 13th century Syria, that is the image on the top left, was used as the vessel that caught the water from washing hands. It is highly decorated and ornate, inlaid with silver, highlighting the figures on horseback on the horizontal register that wraps around the external surface as well as the figures standing in arched niches below the rim on the inside. There are also inscriptions developed as decorative patterns that adorn both inside and outside of the vessel. An object such as this basin appears to have been highly sought after by Christian churches and patrons for baptismal rites for instance, as it must have been seen 
beautiful and prestigious to own and appropriate to use for religious ceremonies. Some of the techniques of making vessels such as the ewer known as the blockas ewer, the image on the right below, required cutting, hammering, and soldering pieces of metal together before decorating the surface by engraving or inlaying silver. An earlier engraved bronze ewer from Egypt, which is said to have belonged to the murdered Caliph Almar I II, the last Umayyad ruler, is noteworthy not only for its zoomorphic attributes, by that I mean the rooster at the spout, for instance, but also for the use of decorative ornaments on its surface and neck that is reminiscent of jewelry worn by a person. In fact, the terms used to refer to parts of such an object, like neck, that I just mentioned, I think explains that the textured decorations applied allude to pieces of jewelry such as beads or strands of pearls. The metal was also used to make mosque lamps. In this image, a mosque lamp from Cunha is pierced on its surface to allow the light to show through. This is done in a highly decorated manner, closely resembling lace work. The shape of the lamp was also repurposed and made by using other materials, such as ceramics, to create other types of vessels. In this glazed earthenware vessel from Basra, Iraq, whose shape possibly was inspired by a mosque lamp, the textured surface appears to have been made by pressing clay into molds, again reproducing the rich ornate look of beads on the surface, but arranged in geometric designs. The finials on top of the handles are unusual and rare in such works, but clearly they were meant to add to the decoration of the vessel. In finishing ceramic works, glazing is one of the techniques that adds luster and color to the baked clay that is ordinarily dull and earth color. This technique was used to finish the surface decoration of vessels to be sure, but as glazed tile works on the two images show in this slide, they were regularly used to enhance the surface of walls, domes, and other architectural surfaces. The tiles on the dome of the Royal Mosque in Isfahan from the early 17th century are designed in patterns and transferred to greenware or unbaked clay, then cut up for the different parts of the design, each taking their color glaze and shape fired and brought back together like a jigsaw puzzle. Of course, in the case of the square and pressed tile with Prince Bahram and Azadi image, the glaze is added, then fired. In the latter example, clearly the epic or mythological stories served as inspiration for the subject that must have been seen as appropriate for decorating the palace of the Mongol rulers of Iran called the Ilkhanids in the late 13th century. The art of ceramic, particularly the blue and white Chinese porcelain, was a much appreciated and collected art in Europe as well as the Middle East, but they were quite costly. The imported Chinese blue and white was made with high quality porcelain finished through a highly technical and secretive process and seen as prestigious to own. In the 9th century, the Middle Eastern potters, in an attempt to reproduce the look of Chinese blue and white, stumbled upon a new type of glazing that is known as white tin glaze. The bowl on the right below, which is made of composite body, which means pieces of clay that are put together rather than thrown, shows in order to imitate the translucent, thin-walled appearance of the Chinese porcelain, the walls of the bowl were pierced and the blue glaze was added. Ceramic glaze chemically is akin to glass, which was a medium made popular 
with respect to the art of the object in Islamic regions by the desire to reproduce another valuable material, the rock crystal. In this slide, the two examples are side by side. The one on the left is clear glass fused with turquoise color glass that is cut to mimic the look of carved valuable stone, hence called cameo glass. On the right is the exquisite example of rock crystal ewer that is cut and braced with metal under the handle and at its base. The turquoise blue bowl in this slide is also made to reproduce the look of the semi-precious stone cut bowls. Glass then was a material that was used to make a variety of objects such as this mosque lamp which was decorated with enamel and gold bearing the patron's family's blazon, the red cup on the upper part of the lamp, as well as Quranic inscriptions. The other two examples are both from Fatimid period and show two different techniques in making and finishing glassware. The personal vessels used by the Mughals in India like Shah Jahan's wine cup from the 17th century carved out of white jade is another exquisite example of using precious material in crafting objects. Shah Jahan's cup has a precursor in the turco mongol ruler Oluk Beg from 15th century that appears to reflect the far eastern heritage of his predecessors in comparison to Shah Jahan's which reflects some European characteristics along with the naturalism of indigenous Indian art seen in the lotus flower, for example, at the base of the cup. Perhaps one of the most recognized and admired of all arts from the Middle East is the carpet, which generically sometimes has been called oriental rugs as in what Europe called all the regions to its east indiscriminately orient. The carpets are woven on upright looms as seen in this slide by making a knot where the warp and the weft cross in the colors corresponding to a design that is laid out on a checkered paper, much like the colored pixels on the TV monitor with each tiny square representing a knot. The carpet on the right from 16th century has a fine example of such rugs that incorporates a medallion in the middle with a scalloped outline that is striking against its black background. It combines vegetal patterns and calligraphy using wool, silk, and silver threads. The use of calligraphy as decorative motif will be our next topic.